Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the XY team has spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business. And what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you wanna work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a, a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market. How do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, me 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recording that I've done so far, the interviews, and uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop, easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net, or visit financialexpress.net for more information. Well, uh, mate, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Evans, uh, all the way from sunny Dubai. Is that the is that the UAE? Is that I need to work yes. on my geography, mate. Yeah, uh, no, United Arab Emirates. There's seven Emirates. Uh, Dubai is one of those. Uh, Abu Dhabi is another one too that people probably heard of as well. And then there's lots of smaller ones like Sharjah, Ajman, Ras Al Khaim, and a few others. So, uh, yes, uh, sitting in the desert. Well, given or the sand or the sand pit, as we like to call it. <laughs> Given uh, Sharjah is the dry state, we probably don't need to spend too much time talking about that. But um, no, 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 Dubai is a good state, <laughs> <laughs> mate. Thank you for for uh, for joining us and taking the time. I know it's uh, busy setting up your thing, and I I know that we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But uh, you know, we're we're talking today part of this plan produce profit series. Uh, just just had a whole bunch of great conversations around how to plan an epic service proposition. This is the first one around. Uh, how to how to produce efficiently, which is all about you know having a user experience optimized engagement process, setting things up in a scalable way. So keen to sort of pick your brain. Uh, I just just mentioned just before we kicked off that it's been a little while since we've caught up on the the practical side of what's going on in your business. Uh, so yep. look forward to to hearing about the evolution. But mate, um, firstly, uh, you know, talking from the other side of the world, give us the give us a scoop. Look, I mean, uh, we've been talking for a while now about having a, an office overseas uh, and or multiple offices overseas. So it was sort of the natural um, progression of, of Atlas. You know, from our point of view, it was always about um, providing the best level of service and the most specialised level of advice to Australian expats. And it sort of makes sense to be where the expats are. So uh, uh, Dubai is the first phase of what we're trying to achieve. Um, by getting boots on the ground and being able to have these conversations with expats. You know, the expat landscape is, in, you know, from a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of in the last two years, it's a it's an 11 when it comes to the amount of changes that are going on right now. So, uh, and we're finding that information is lacking uh, or there's too many rumours or, you know, there's not the right amount of um education going on with expats so it's always a lot easier to have those conversations face to face or running seminars locally so we've gone from a, a digital only platform to now digital and boots on the ground so um here we are in dubai mate uh tr- blazing the trail yourself you know how better to advise the expats than to become an expat yourself yeah um, walk the walk and talk the talk <laughs> that's it mate love it it's like uh 
just had a kid recently and I've been saying to all my clients, I got about half of my clients are, are still yet to have kids and uh, I just say to them, look, I'm, as we're going, I'm, I'm creating the cheat sheets and telling you all the things so that you can, uh, you know, that's how much we care about customer service. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Exactly. You're right. You're, you're, you're beta testing the product. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mate, so um, sorry, Anna, I should have said for anyone that's been living under a rock, uh, Atlas Wealth Management, give us it just in terms of a, a, a quick overview. So, um, you guys, how long have you been going? Uh, as of next month, it'll be eight years. Well, uh, your team, what does your team look like? Uh, right now, it's about, it keeps changing, uh, nine or 10, or depending on the day of the week. Um, so, we've got primarily everyone's located on the Gold Coast. Um, I'm, I'm on lonesome here in Dubai, looking to build up that uh, that team here. Um, and a mix of uh, CSOs, AAs, uh, power planners and advisors as well, um, as well as operations and that sort of stuff as well too. So certainly um, when my first hire occurred in 2015, so I was a solo advisor from 2011 to 2015, um, probably should have made the call earlier to hire people. Uh, but it's, it's probably the most daunting thing you've ever done is take someone on your payroll um, a for cash flow and B for responsibility. Um, you know, if you have a bit of a bad month, it's your fault. But whereas when you had a bad month and you got people relying on the salary, um, yeah, that was sort of scared me a bit. But um, you know, so for, virtually first high came on in 2015, and and we always from day one, um, it was always about building a platform which is scalable. You know, it was never about this is going to be one or two people. Um, Sophie who was my first CSO, uh, who's now our operations manager. The reason I actually hired her is because she had experience in setting up offices and as well as the financial planning side, but had the experience of building. Um, we didn't want to hire someone who is just used to coming in on day one, turn the computer on and going to work. Uh, we had nothing. So when it comes to yep. tasks, workflows, templates, everything, we had to build it from scratch. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing that there is a big difference I've noticed in uh, followed a, a, a similar ish journey in that for the first so almost three years of the business I resisted hiring anyone except for my wife now Yang uh, uh, but yeah it's now having growing the team more it's like you if you don't have someone that specifically does have that skill set in creating things for themselves it's uh, it's not something that comes naturally to a lot of people as well so uh, cool. So, and then how long have you been advising before you before you kicked off Atlas eight years ago? 2001 was my first year. So, I've um, uh, been in the game since 97, started off as an analyst with the yeah. ASX um, and then worked for HSBC, Suncorp, and then uh, it was a great firm called Salomon Smith Barney, um, which no one in Australia has ever heard of. It's pretty much the biggest firm in the US in terms of financial advisors. And it was a great firm. It was, you know, sort of run by advisors for advisors sort of mentality. Um, and it was a fantastic firm. Um, but then as the integration came on, so Salons at Barney used to be called County Net West, who people in Australia might know. And then it was umbrellaed under Citigroup. Um, going through that process wasn't the most pleasant of processes um, because there became a more of a global standardization. They were setting rules for advisors who had Series 7's license in the US, but they'd say to Australia, you must abide by these rules, even though they had no bearing on our clients or ourselves. So um, going into 2009, uh, sorry, 2007, 2008, we all know what happened then, and mm. clients were coming to us, and they were quite fearful um, when it came to their money because they knew we were a US firm even though everything was chess sponsored and local custodians and all sorts of things. So um, myself and a business partner, our colleague, uh, decided to make the jump and we uh, applied for an AFSL back in 09. Uh, 10 days from the bottom of the market, we thought we were either geniuses or stupid or still don't know what the case <laughs> Some was. Some sort of combination more likely. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, I think, I think uh, naive is probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much we set up uh, a practice and then not too far into it, um, I've always found I had these milestones from a birthday point of view and I was 35 and I went home and, I, and just had a really bad day. Well, obviously still trying to come out of the bottom of the, the GFC. And I said, this can't continue the way I'm running my business, you know, how I'm operating, who I'm working with. It was virtually a, you know, open door policy for everyone. 
and uh, I was hitting that critical mass size. So I went home one day and just uh, decided to write down, you know, a page of, and, and, and I don't like business plans because I think you're sort of sometimes too beholden to those things, but it was mm. just who I want, what I want to do for the next five years. And yeah. uh, it jumped off the page that I should be working with experts. You know, they were time poor, um, most importantly, um, respected uh, advice. That was a big thing I was butting up against. I was having too many conversations with people who just wouldn't listen. So um, uh, people respected advice, uh, weren't fee sensitive, and I had a natural in with that being obviously a former expat myself living in the US and Hong Kong. So, you know, expats, even though they're Australians, are a very different breed, you know, and you talk expat. You know, there's a language there which uh, a lot of residents of Australia wouldn't understand, even though they're Australians, and they do it with an Australian accent. So, and it's more of an understanding than a than a language barrier. So, um, decided to go all in uh, a month after the birth of my second daughter. Um, don't recommend that because uh, <laughs> you think you've got no sleep when you have a baby, or well, you have no sleep and starting a company, you really have no sleep. And uh, pretty much. Uh, whether it's because I'm taurine and stubborn, uh, just for the next two years, just blasted out content and just just listen to no one. You know, everyone said I'm crazy. Everyone said I'm stupid. Um, and I just blocked out all noise and devoured myself in producing content and getting out there. I saw that social media was the gateway for what I was trying to achieve uh, because you got to have conversations at scale. And dovetailed that in with, you know, sort of flying around and, and, and running seminars locally and visiting people, um, it just slowly started to to gain momentum. And that was in 2015. That's when I sort of had the courage to make my first hire. And um, it's sort of been like that ever since. Yeah. Awesome, man. And so what's at the moment, can I ask, your revenue sort of band? Yep. Uh, in terms of uh, what total revenue? Yeah. Yep. Last year was the first year we crossed a mill. Okay. So uh, that was a that was a big thing for us. It's um, you know it proves that scalability is working because if I look at our headcount in count increase versus our revenue increase, mm. um, it's it's there's no correlation, which is good. You know, if, yeah. if you had to keep hiring staff to keep that trajectory, then all you are is just hiring staff. You're not actually doing anything. Whereas yeah. uh, you know our staffing is increasing twenty to thirty percent, but our revenue is increasing between forty and seventy percent, um, or depending on on what what metric you're looking at at the time. Awesome. Yes. Well, we're talking all about scalability today, so keen to to jump into uh, how you engage and uh, yeah, because I know it, as I, I mentioned at the start that it's been a little while since I've got an update from you, but. You know, working last time we we chatted about this in detail when you were still based in Australia. You know, obviously you're working with people from all around the globe, uh, people on different time zones, people at a time four, as you mentioned, uh, as well. So I know that at that time you had a real focus on being able to make it easy for them to engage at a time that was convenient, but also for to make it because people will pick things up. You were telling me uh, run with them for a bit, and then they get caught up in in other things so it needs to be a way that you guys are able to manage things efficiently as well so uh can you uh, you know obviously you you're uh, you've been on a bit of a journey but take us through that that process how you you've ended up where you have when it comes to that that scalability and efficiency piece yeah look i think there's there's sort of three stages that we look at um and the first stage is obviously uh the inquiry you know, we're quite fortunate now where every day quite a few inquiries come through and there's almost like a triage opportunity at that point to determine, yes, we can help, no, we can't help, and if we can't help, go speak to this person. So um, that's the first and foremost, always a response within 24 hours um, without fail. You know, we always have a response back in 24 hours. You know, I know when I've sent an inquiry off to another company and two days, three days later, you haven't received a response, um, I've already gone and found someone else. So from my point of view, it's always about ensuring that that, you know, that process is, is solid. Um, the next part of it is obviously reaching back out and, and organising a time for a call. And usually it's Zoom, Skype, um, GoToMeeting, whatever tool we need to use in different jurisdictions because we can't use all tools in all jurisdictions. So it's a matter of um, scheduling that time um, and proceeding just to a, a 
20 minute, half an hour, sometimes 60 minute call, um, finding more about them and then, you know, working out how we can help. At that point, um, we've always found it's quite decisive or divisive in terms of the timeframes. So there's those who um, just jump straight on it and they, they're coming back to us as quick as we go to them and the advice process goes very quickly. There's others who just go dark. And, you know, when I say go dark is they don't respond to emails, you know, all these sort of things. And and initially we were like, what have we done? So we, we constantly go back and revisit what we're doing. But then we suddenly realised, you know, a lifestyle of an expat is incredibly busy, incredibly frantic and, and turbulent. And a lot of the times they're travelling for work or there's board, like there's all sorts of things that go through their life. So we'd found that people would come back to us a week, a month, six months later after that first email to say, hey, I'm still here. You know, sorry about, uh, sorry about you know, the delay there. This reason happened or this reason happened. So very quickly it dawned on us that we can't rely on a acceptable turnaround time um, for that reason. So what we did was worked out two things. A, we need to give them a time frame. You know, and we virtually tell them uh, when they engage us to provide financial advice, um, we send them a online fact find for them to go through and complete it. And we virtually tell them they've got seven days to do it. If they don't complete it within seven days, they go to the back of the queue. And what we've found is it works for about 60, 70% of people. The other 30%, they're happy to go to the back of the queue, which is fine. So yeah. what we're always trying to do is, you know, those who are willing and ready and committed, to get them through first. Yeah. Um, it also means that we have to have a very wide pipe because if we're working on two or three leads a month, it's, you know, you can get that going. Whereas right now, I haven't looked at the numbers, but there would have to be over 100 uh, leads at any one point in time that we're working on that are at different stages, whether still waiting for them to come back to us, still waiting for them to engage us, still waiting for them to set up a time for an SOA meeting. You know, there's all these different bits and different pieces. So, that's where you and I discussed before about pipe drive, which mm-hmm. is great because you have those stages and you just virtually drag a tile straight across into it. So what we've done is because 90, 95% of our inquiries come through our website, we've used uh, obviously Gravity Forms as our contact form, which then creates a deal inside um, pipe drive. So first stage is initial contact. And you know then what we do is as they go through that journey, you can drag them. And that rotting feature is great because it gives you a chance to, you know, chase them up because, you know, you can see that it's been seven days since you've heard back for them. So certain that pipe drive has enabled us to manage well over 100 uh, inquiries at one time, but wow. not dropping the ball with any one of them. So because mm. it became impossible trying to manage who was at what stage. Um, yeah. And uh, pipe drive has been invaluable for that. Awesome. And so the so the inquiry comes in, you respond to the inquiry, and then you ask them to do the fact find, do you? Uh, no, no, we, no, because some t- sometimes uh, experts, the, we've found that the inquiry can be embedded in other ways, if that makes sense. Mm. They'll come to us and say, um, I need tax advice on my tax returns. But in actual fact, they're actually not asking about tax returns. They're asking about non-residency status, investing, and super. So that's where we find that first initial call, that triage, gives us an opportunity to have that chat and say, no, you know what? You don't need us. You just need an accountant who does a lot of expat mm-hmm. work or yeah. you need a – we don't do risk in-house. You need to speak to our colleague who does our risk work for us or a mortgage broker and so on and so forth. So rather than tie them up, you know, we found – I've always talked about it, that sort of frictionless experience – Rather than yeah. getting to go through that process of of um, of doing that, from from our point of view, it's um, almost reversing it, making it so we let's just get on a call, let's have a chat, let's meet, and then work out what the next step is. And it's after that call, and they come back to us and say, "Yep, yeah, let's go for it." That's when the fact find goes out. Okay. Um, the good thing about the fact find is to sort of become emotionally invested. They've verbally said yes. I want to do this. I want to go through that journey. We've obviously provided them, you know, things up until that point about the advice journey, the process and, and what they can expect to achieve out of that. But then what we do is something a little bit different is we actually uh, charge for an SOA fee up front. Um, and when I say up front is that's before the SOA is even presented. 
And the reason we do that is we found that we were producing SOAs and people were just not responding. Yeah. You know, they go right up to that point and then they just disappear. And I think it was a combination of, A, it was costing us money because it's very hard to track someone down in California mm. or UK <laughs> who's engaged us for an SOA and, you know, sort of done the runner on us. But also, B, by getting them to pay, it's funny how how much more motivated they are after mm. they're paid to get that process going and, and quickly. So it's um, it's been a good process. It's, it's We're always tweaking it. You know, every week there's always that sort of little change here, little change there. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, you know, every time I think we got it, I look back a year later and think, oh, no, we're better in close. Now we've yeah. got it, you know. So there's, it's that evolution of, of delivery. Um, mm. But, you know, from our point of view, the hardest thing is, is geography. You know, trying to, you know, you're not just like getting someone to sign some paperwork. Imagine, imagine they're sitting in New York. You know, yeah. they'll say, oh, yeah, I'll get to it this weekend. And then work or personal issues or whatever, oh, sorry, mate, I'll get to it next weekend. So it's a matter of trying to smooth out that process as much as possible just to say, okay, here's the information, here's what you want, let's do it. Yeah, for sure. And um, I look, I think it's it's one of the, you know, one of the beauties of financial advice to me is the, the ability to essentially experiment where you can tweak one aspect of your process with the, with the next client that you work with and they will never know that that's not the way that you've been doing it for 10 years and you just see what works, see what doesn't, get some feedback uh, and it allows you to do that that constant and never-ending improvement which is what leads to, uh, you know, that award, award-winning award service essentially, right? You so, never know unless you try. That's it. So what do you use, just a quick one, what do you use for your forms for, for the fact line? I mean, I'm assuming that you're not sending them a, a, a PDF. No, no, Gravity Forms, So, which is okay. embedded inside our website. And um, it's brilliant. For the fact line as well. Yep. Okay. So it's quite a detailed one. Um, the amount of information we require as opposed to an Australian resident client is quite different. So mm. we'll go through and talk about issues and it's conditional logic. So we'll go through and, and, and let's say, for example, it's someone in Australia who is planning on moving overseas, then they won't get all these other questions about overseas tins, overseas addresses, all those sort of bits and pieces. Um, the good thing about the fact fund, and, and I know a lot of people are nervous about it, you know, in terms of being online, and I know there were some conversations the other day on XY about it as well too. Um, from our point of view, it's easy for them to complete it at home because that's where the documents are you know and we actually inside that fact find they upload their passport they upload their super statements they upload everything that comes up into there and from that um you know by the time they've engaged us and completed the fact find there's no gaps yeah but one thing that's come out of the royal commission and something we're very cognizant of was we wanted in their own words what their expectations are what their problems are and what they want to do achieve. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a fact find in the advisor's handwriting, um, you know, I know in a court of law, um, you know, the lawyer's just going to pull that apart. Whereas if I have an IP address in Singapore, in Hong Kong, London, Dubai, wherever, mm. and uh, in their own words, they've typed it in, and we've done that, uh, to me, it's it's just sort of providing that rigidity behind the scalable process. Mm. For sure, man. Look, I, to be honest, I, I didn't understand. I know that some advisors, you know, do it and, and do it well with, with doing the fact finds themselves. But, uh, yeah, there's a, obviously you want to be covered from a from a compliance perspective. That's that's clearly that's the hygiene factor. But also just it's like you say, like p- people have got the information at home um, or they can pull on it. They can work through it in their time. It's efficient instead of me sitting down with a client and asking them what their middle name is and what's their next of kin details. Like to me, that just yep. that just seems like a like I I just gonna need to charge them more because I'm sitting there holding their hand while they provide basic information. So we do it with um, clients. We we have like a fact find, like a clarified type meeting, but we'll send them the fact find before we use form stack, which is similar ish. Although I I'm, I love the fact that you can upload documents inside yours, which we can't do in, in ours. Um, but then you can, it allows you in that conversation to focus on, well, what's jumping off the page to say, is this correct or is this not correct? And you thought, did you mean that? Was that missed on purpose? I remember you mentioned something about the share portfolio. There's nothing there. Did you mean to include that? What was missing? And take the conversation to a higher level instead of just getting basic, easy 
sort of stuff. So the thing is, I think, you know, people will only tell you what they're prodded to ask. And the great thing about when you look at the the native version of the fact find, um, it is ours is a monster. But if they don't have risk insurance, if they don't have property, you know, that is sit no, and suddenly all those questions mm. go away. So from a client's point of view, if you're a university student who's about to move overseas, so all you've got is hex and a little bit of super, our fact find you can get it done in two or three minutes. You know, if you are um, husband and wife living in the US and you have foreign and domestic pensions and you have an estimate, like, you know, that will be a mm. complex one. But then again, that's going to be complex anyway. So I don't see why putting clients who have simple backgrounds through a complex procedure and that's the beautiful thing about an online fact find with conditional logic is it is customized to that person if they're yeah. if they're single they have no kids they're not going to ask about spouse or kids yeah and the other thing we yeah. found too was you know i don't know about a lot of advisors out there but my handwriting is shocking like i yeah. Should have been should have been a doctor and uh <laughs> yeah. the amount of time i was wasting just going back and forth with admin correcting you know what my handwriting said yeah. Um, it's amazing when it's typed in. You just you never get an integration problem between what's in your CRM and and the, and the truth. Mm. And so, when the people em- enter their data through the Gravity Form Fact Find, does that where does that go? Does that go directly into your CRM? No, it doesn't. No, that's that's the. I guess we haven't found that holy grail yet. We are working towards it, but um, it's because our clients have a lot of offshore stuff. We, we probably couldn't do it anyway. Um, because a lot of offshore CR, a lot of CRMs don't have a lot of offshore capabilities. Yeah. So we sort of prefer it. So it goes to our admin assistant, who, um, as soon as they hit submit, a cop, at the beginning of the fact find, they select who their advisor they're talking to is, and at the end, a copy will go to the advisor, and a copy goes to the admin associate. The admin associate then completes all the uh, builds the file inside Midwinter, and then. And once they've finalised that, that then triggers a, a task for the CSO, to, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a daisy chain process. Everything's handed off. Um, building a scalable solution, you don't refer to task giving to people by their name. You do it referring to um, their job title. And the reason mm-hmm. being is if you decide to put another CSO on, um, yeah, that's going to create issues if your CSO's name is Fred. Um, it'll always keep going to, you know, one CSO and not the other. So yep. that's where we've always been cognizant in that process of making sure that the process is scalable uh, by making those tasks and workflows by job title, not by um, or responsibility, not by name. Makes sense. And all of that's driven in midwinter. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So, so virtually, we use pipe drive up until um, engagement. Yep. And there's a bit of cross pollination because we use pipe drive also to track the stage of where it is on an SOA and responses and those sort of things and mm-hmm. ATPs. But um, once they engage us and do the fact find, that's when it starts loading up into midwinter, and then virtually from midwinter, I had never counted it. There's lots um, of tasks that then spin off um, in different directions, including once the client's actually on board at 100 days after, uh, or not 100 days, might be 30 or 60 days after they become a client. Um, it actually triggers a task for the AA to send out a gift package to the client. So everything is in- incredibly documented all the way through so that we can pull someone off the street tomorrow. As long as they've got an understanding of financial services, we can work with the computer and they can, we can scale them up very quickly. Yeah. Awesome. And and so obviously with your clients all being overseas, you're working with them. You're not working well with the exception of you. Clearly you're a, you're on a mission to, to do that in Dubai at the moment, but <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, but outside of that, I'm, I'm assuming that most of your clients should be working with remotely. Yes. Yeah. Look, I would say 98. Uh, yeah. percent um, I think we get between two and four visits a year. <laughs> so our boardroom is the right. most underutilized room ever. <laughs> it's it's a waste of space. But um, yeah, it's uh, you know, and it's amazing. It's I think advisors have an aversion towards it, but people are using it anyway. I mean, grandparents are talking to their kids and, you know, everything is done in this sort of fashion. So it doesn't replace face-to-face. And that's why one of the reasons why we're here in Dubai. Um, it doesn't replace it, but it's 80% of it. You know, um, mm. 
when you when you when you remove that visual capacity, you lose eighty percent of your body language. So uh, you can do a lot through video, um, and yeah, you know, I think it's it's it, you know it's amazing the conversations you have. You know, I've got a, a couple uh, in uh, San Francisco, and every time we have a call, it's always you know late afternoon, early evening airtime, and and they have G and T sitting in front of them. You know, other other <laughs> calls. You know, uh, you know we have cats walking across the front of the screen or babies on laps and. It's it's yeah. great because we can have these personal conversations that yeah. don't even involve financial advice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my uh, my cats cleans my cleans my webcam on uh, <laughs> when I'm working from the home office for sure. Uh, great, man. And so, how do you do like file sharing and documentation? You mentioned waiting on on signing documents for for people. Obviously, some financial services stuff you need that, but. I'm assuming that you're uh, you, you're trying to do digital documents and file sharing and that sort of stuff where you can. Yeah, from a internal point of view, we use Dropbox for business, um, yeah. which is brilliant because you can set up as well as your members. You can set up groups. Um, so if it's operational stuff um, that you don't want, um, you know, employees to see, but you need to share it with senior management or business partners or those sort of people, you can have a folder there with that content in it, whether it's, you know, employment agreements and that sort of stuff. Um, then you can also have, we have folders per advisor um, and then different staff members can see different folders, which is great. So, you know, it's been an interesting experiment to go through the process of setting up here because nothing has changed in our system at all. You know, it's virtually yeah, connect wow. to Wi-Fi and go. Um, you know, and I'm sharing documents here real time. I'm still being able to do everything I was doing sitting on the Gold Coast. So I think that's an important part, especially when you have not only just intra-office, but, you know, other external offices as well or different remote staff. Um, to be able to share those documents real time is incredibly important. Once again, I know there's an aversion towards cloud-based software, but um, I think it's a, you know, probably a, an education thing as well too. I mean, you know, I would rather trust a team of encryption experts who work for Dropbox than saving things on my C drive that any 13-year-old can break into. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I think there's a lot of, yeah, there, there's, look, there's been a lot of bad things, that's for sure. But there's always going to be mm. bad things, you know. So you just don't hear about the other ones. You don't hear about the smaller ones. Yeah, and unfortunately, everything is all you know hackable these days. It's uh, the, the, I think the question of what is what is safe is uh, is is really a subjective one. So, I understand that point. So, yeah, look. So, tell me uh, at the moment, a, are there any key efficiency projects that you're working on in your business? I know that you're uh, you're probably barely occupied with that. <laughs> We're trying to get up to speed over in Dubai, but what are the key what are the key things on that front, if any? Right now, we're going through um, reviewing the organisation from a structure point of view in terms of how we're going to service clients. You know, the biggest thing we're always cognizant of is, you know, it's great to be bringing all these clients all the time, but if you're not looking after once they get on board, they're just going to spit out the other side and you're not going to scale anything up. Sure. So from our point of view, we're looking at who the next hire should be and you always need to be looking at three to six months down the track. Because from our point of view, you know, if we're not front of centre of their mind and just saying, look, we're here for you the whole time, um, you know, images and thoughts come into people's mind, whether they're correct or not, and they'll, they'll judge you on the back of that. So um, it's going to be one of those things where we want to make sure we're high touch, but geographically quite a long way away. So, you know, little things like just a quick email, g'day, Ben. I uh, hope you and the the wife and the new baby are well. Um, you know, just let so you know we're here for you. It's amazing, you know, getting an email like that, the power of it. Yeah. But, you know, when you're overseas, away from family and friends, just to know someone's there for you. Mm. You know, the last thing we want is that approach where they don't hear for us for six or 12 months, not that it ever happens. But, you know, we just want to be always front and centre of their mind that we've got their back here. You know, we sort of joke about we keep their backyard in Australia clean while they go overseas to work. Um, and we want them to feel that way that, you know, there's no burglars coming in, you know, sort of breaking in and, and, and the grass is, is getting long. So to us, it's a combination. I think we've got the technology pat down well. You know, we've virtually rebuilt midwinter 
um, and customise that to suit us. Um, when it comes to technology stacks, I don't like to make them too big because then you get integration issues, you know, and they become quite unwieldy. And next thing you know, you have to hire an IT staff member to manage all the integrations. So it's uh, we've sort of kept it pretty simple when it comes to, you know, sort of pipe drive and midwinter being sort of the cause. Um, yep. And then, you know, obviously Dropbox of business sits behind as the vault, mm-hmm. um, so to speak. So, you know, the other thing issue you've got as well too when you're scaling is you want to make sure that if someone is sick, you can still get access to things. And that's where having that central repository uh, of information is important because, um, you know, if someone gets hit by a bus or sick or whatever happens, they, uh, you know, you need to, business needs to continue. And um, the, the true test of that was uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and, and uh, I decided to take our daughters up to Hamilton Island for a couple of days, um, what was meant to be a, a, you know, just a quick sort of long weekend getaway. Um, and we ended up being on, on there when uh, Cyclone Debbie went through. So uh, oh, wow. it was, uh, you know, I was off the grid for a week. And, yeah. you know, at that point we had Sophie and another staff member and I remember sitting there just going, I could get one bar if I walked all the way to the top of the, the mountain in the middle of Hamilton <laughs> Island and get these sort of cryptic messages and text messages out. Um, and it's amazing. When I walked back in the office the following week, it's like nothing had changed. So yeah. that to me was the affirmation I needed. Okay, what we're doing is right. It's working because everyone else has continued working. They knew their process, their tasks were automatically triggered, workflows were going through. Um, in actual fact, people were sort of like, you know, well, you know, what are you doing here? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. It does make it it it, uh, it easy with the, with the systems. But I I love that the keeping things simple from a, from a tech stack perspective. I think that's a that's a, a critical one. Um, just so because it's more things to manage. And I think for any small business, like you say, unless you've got a, a dedicated resource to to do that, it's something that ultimately falls back onto the. To the senior leaders in the business and uh, more things for, for people to be across. So, um, I think also yeah. too, if you if you have too many, you don't understand the whole thing enough. Mm. You know, whereas you know, midwinter, we know the chassis, we know the shocks, we like we've pulled it apart that much. We know the system very well. Um, you know, the same with Dropbox for business, the same with Pipe Drive. Um, I think a lot of people sign up to a lot of different. Uh, pieces of technology, but they don't use ten percent of it, and they go, "Oh, that's crap," you know, and stop using it. In actual fact, they've got to go all in and see whether it's worthwhile or not. Yeah, I agree. I think that we we're on this journey with uh, with this Salesforce based um, CRM, and the reason that we chose that is because we know that it can you can you know adapt it and do anything like you talk about with with Midwinter. You can tweak everything and sort of build it around what you want. But uh, it is easy to to get frustrated and see you, you start to use something and go shit because it is a lot of work. Like I'm sure you know you talk about customizing midwinter. I've, I've been on a similar journey from the Salesforce side, and it's uh, you know it's frustrating, it's hard work, it's time consuming, it can be expensive, or it's it's definitely a significant investment in, in getting that set up. So. Um, how do you tell me? How did you? How do you decide what to prioritize? Clearly, you spent a bit of time with your with your midwinter and automating everything out. What was the process that you took to to figuring out what it is that you build out? Where do you start? Where do you go next? How do you tackle that? It was pretty much putting yourself in the client's shoes and just thinking about the client journey. You know, not only what you have to do as advisor from a compliance point of view and from a professional point of view. But what the client expects and and how they expect to sort of uh, integrate with that. So it was in actually physical form. I actually put bits of paper down on the boardroom table, and just broke it down into sections. And then you know from each section by categorising the section, then you can assign tasks to different roles and different different people. Um, I don't recommend going too deep first in because you'll actually never get it done. So, yeah. you know, breaking it down, summarizing it, and then attacking it that way um, is the best way. Because if you break something, don't break it down to 50 or 60 items because it becomes very hard to work out what works and what doesn't work. So break it down into 10 items or 10, 10 tasks um, and then see how that goes. And then you tweak each, each of those tasks 
So, you know, you might tweak task number five of 10 and that will then split off into two. And then sort of it builds over time. I mean, you know, just uh, just today we paid down to build to midwinter for a, for a customised coding, you know, templating as well. We're always just tweaking, always tweaking. Because if we were resigned and happy with Atlas where it is now and didn't want it to grow, we wouldn't do it. You know, but yep. we're always thinking ahead. Okay, you know, we've got uh, 800 clients. If we have 1,500 clients, you know, how's that going to look? Uh, and I don't want to get to that point to have that client have a bad experience because you weren't constantly going forward and thinking about what the next step is, what the next step is. So mm-hmm. it's all those little bits and pieces. But, you know, I think a lot of people haven't actually documented or mapped out the process or they've just yeah. gone along with what they've done in the past or what the dealer groups told them in the past. There's, ne- there's been, never been any free thought about, you know, the actual process itself. Yeah. Well, I think process is how my brain works, but there are, you know, there are different types of learners. Have you ever done any sort of disc profiling or we followed the wealth dynamics Roger Hamilton uh, approach, which is, which is similar uh, ish to, to that. And they talk about the di- Some people are more, you know, coming up with ideas. Some people are more focused on processes. Some people are more about the people and, and some people are more about the timing. And, uh, I think I've done a bit of reading on it and, and found that there is only, it, it's, I think it was about 20% of all people are, are that process uh, minded, which I think is a massive advantage when it comes to, to this uh, stuff, because at least it, it, it's like you say that you don't have to just follow what the dealer group said or uh, what to do. But then I think at the same time for me, I can, and I've got, I keep things pretty simple in our business that we have a, we have a new prospect process but from like made an inquiry to become a client. Then we have one for onboarding, one for ongoing and one for reviews. And, uh, you know, some of them, the onboarding one is the biggest one because it's going right through that initial uh, client, bringing a new client on. And, you know, there are 60 odd steps or something like that, which are different forks yep. and bits and pieces because it is a, you know, it's a, it's a complex sort of thing. And there's obviously it's an important thing from a, internal perspective a client experience perspective and a compliance perspective but what i found is that when i first i roll out this process and i'm typing it up in my thing but as soon as you hand it off to somebody then they go hold on a second what's what's this and it doesn't make sense to them so then you have to go oh crap okay hold on a sec let's wind it back well what's what are we trying to do here what is it what is the what's the gap what do we how do we need to fix it but uh i you know i think that um, yeah, when the, it's like a best laid plan sort of thing that you have to you have to tweak things. And I find that every, well, I was doing it once a year when it was just Yang and I, but now that there's more people in the team, I'm having to review the processes more and more often because it's uh, things are changing faster and also people people's approach, we've got to try and make it easier for them as well. But I find that that's probably one of the most important ways to drive efficiencies in, in the business. Uh, and also, like you say, that can get deliver just deliver that consistent experience for all of your clients. It's the McDonald's approach. I mean, whether you get a, a Big Mac from Sydney or the Champs Elysees in Paris, a Big Mac's mm-hmm. a Big Mac, and it's that client expectation. If you're setting that expectation but not delivering on it, you know, it's 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 on you. And um, if you can't scale, if you if your capacity is is one client a week. Um, but you're not changing, it always will be one client a week. Mm. If you tweak things and streamline things, and to me, it's 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 about uh, senior management articulating to the firm what they want to achieve, but then empowering the employees to help design the process because exactly what you said, you might have in your mind how it goes, but uh, it might be gobbledygook to everyone else. So, yeah, I think getting getting all that buy-in from everyone um, is the most important part of the process because we've found in the past through trial and error when we didn't have buy-in from certain staff members, there were things being missed, and you know you pick up on that normally after they've left, um, but then you go back and put the safeguards in place to ensure that it hasn't. So it's great because what you can do is you can make certain tasks compulsory that they can't go to the next stage until they've done the first stage, you know, and that's from a, you know, certainly from a, an ownership point of view, it gives me a lot of peace of mind knowing that every person has to tick off that box. We can't get to the next stage. And whether that's support staff or advisors as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, with, with the, the work that you've done so far, clearly it's been pretty extensive, but do you have anything on your horizon in terms of key projects or initiatives in that scalability, efficiency, uh, tech, technology space? Definitely. It's, um, look, we're always cognizant of the fact that not everyone needs an SOA when they're becoming an expat. So we launched out recently. A, Don't tell us it. Yeah, look, it's something that we have, and we had this sign off by a compliance consultant. Um, you know, we launched a product called the Pre-Departure Review, which is, you know, for 295 bucks, they type in their details, put their credit card in, and with one business day, they get emailed a report based on their responses, issues they need to be aware of. So if they've got a PPI in Sydney, we talk about, you know, changing tax status when you become a non-resident. It's not advice to them. There's no products recommended. There's no advice at all. But it's it's sort of like topical, you know, and those sort of things. So, you know, I think there's a there's an Australian resident every uh, one minute fifty three seconds moving overseas for a period of greater than twelve months. You know, right. so what we're trying to do is we're not trying to get two thousand. You know, sort of I think it works out to be eighteen thousand one hundred thirty six people a month to do an SOA. <laughs> we get it. We just want to educate them using technology, um, and then quite often we find that they'll do the pre-departure review and go, you know what, I've got big issues, and then they'll yeah. engage us to do an SOA and you know so forth. Some people just go, okay, cool, I need to be aware of that, great, and then they book their plane yeah. tickets and off they go. But at least yeah. they've been informed, they're aware of of those scenarios. So I guess from our point of view. It's going to be along that line of education and format um, with advice sitting at the top. So um, the more people we can help, the better the result from our point of view, you know, from a financial point of view, but also from a community point of view, uh, misinformation in the exact community is huge. You know, every day we see issues of people receiving the wrong advice, in some cases costing them hundreds and in a couple of cases, a couple of million bucks because wow. they took the wrong advice. So yeah. I guess having those conversations at scale and dovetailing in a scalable basic solution that then they can then escalate themselves to a high level of advice is, is probably where we're going over the, over the coming years. Love it, mate. And so tell me, what thinking back on the, on the last eight years, clearly, you know, efficiency and, and processes have, have been a focus. What's... Um, is there anything that you that you set out to do that just completely didn't work that you sort of that you that you thought would? Yeah, no, no, and it's a great example of of learning by failure. So, because of a couple of clients, we talked about the issues of you know problems with mail, you know mm. what to do with it, you know who should I send it to in Australia and that sort of stuff. So we thought, you know what, let's set up a a, a business where people redirect their mail to us. And we scan it and um, uh, put it up, you know, into a um, highly encrypted vault, so to speak. And uh, they can tell us what to do with it. That way there, it's called expat mail. And I wouldn't pay for that. Does it still exist? Because I'm sold. You know, it, and we surveyed everyone. So we surveyed people. Um, out of the people who responded, 70% said they would. Uh, we also yeah. asked them price points. We asked them everything. And everything came back saying, look, we can make this work. So we rolled it out. And a lot of fan fan, we thought this is going to be easy. We've got a natural client base for this sort of stuff. It's going to happen. Yeah. Huh? No one. In one year of running wow. this, we yeah. had one inquiry. Wow. How much are you charging? Uh, $20 a month. Fuck, I'd pay for that here. Yeah. So, but what it, what it, you know, going through that process, I'm thinking, what's going on? Why isn't this working? And mm. it's sort of the more I thought about it, I thought we're virtually reinventing a a um, uh, a, p- a piston power petrol engine in a electric motor age. People are getting yeah. mail digitally now. Everyone gets their statements yeah. online. So the the mail problem is not as big a problem as we thought. So um, yeah, so that sort of went the way of the data. We may have another crack at it in a different form down the track, um, yeah. but yeah, well, look, it surprised us, you know. That, but I wasn't trying to put our eggs in that one basket. It was yeah, just yeah. 
you know, a complimentary service, I thought, you know, this would be a great value add for clients. But, you know, the fact that no one signed up for it is a great example of, wow. you know, the market always decides. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, I always had visions of the website being our uh, our nexus of our, you know, our, our voice. Um, but the volume of inquiries that we get now and also the consistency um, and how far we can we can go. You know, w- you know, I think we're getting inquiries from countries that I never even heard of and I, you know, thought I knew quite a few countries. Um, so I guess how far, how deep we're getting is probably the, the thing that blows me away. Um, you know, we, we, we did a bit of a soft launch with a podcast early this year. Um, and even though the Dubai, it's sort of been on the back burner while I'm sorting out Dubai, um, I was blown away by how many inquiries we got from that. And we've only done six episodes. So, you know, to me, it's going to be, um, I've always said, I don't want to turn the taps on until I can cope with, um, you know, the demand, I guess you could say. You know, if, if you go out there and blast that and suddenly get 100 inquiries, how would you handle that, those 100 inquiries? And uh, so that's why we've always been sort of just making sure that we can handle any increase and certainly pipe drives helped us with that because, you know, one person might respond in an hour, a day, a week, a month or a year. So you need to be able to build a system that can sort of cope with that, that different response rates but not lose anyone in the process. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the quickest one that I've ever got was uh, a guy who's still a client. He's now in Singapore, but um, – uh, he worked in IT. It was in New York. I followed him on Twitter. He followed me back. Five minutes later, he DM'd me. Five minutes after that, we had a Skype call. And and probably about half an hour after that, he uh, engaged us. So that's an exception, but yeah. it just shows it can happen. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess at the 40,000-foot view, just – you know, if we can do this in all these weird and wacky places, um, advisors in Australia would be able to do this so much simpler than we. You know, it's harder for us to target in different jurisdictions. But, um, you know, if you want to be the advisor of Northern Beaches, um, the opportunity is there. We've, we've never met a firm who just purely specialises in it. So there are advisors who do expat work, but in terms of... In Australia, there's no firms in Australia that all they do is look after expats uh, on the financial advice side. So, I think that's you know, I guess how we have this natural um, attraction to expats. They reach out to us, you know, every day. We're getting you know inquiries since I've been talking to you. Just look on the screen and have another three come through on, for the just through this period of this call. Um, they're naturally seeking out our advice. So, you know, I think. Um, having the courage of convictions to go all in. Um, and it is, you know, being a bit naive, being a bit stupid or a bit stubborn or whatever, or combination of everything. But it just shows that it can be done um, for anything. You know, if you wanted to be an advisor that that uh, specifically targets 38-year-old uh, male truck drivers for Rio Tinto, you could do that. You know, it, it's it's so simple now, and I think people are sort of missing that gap. And and certainly with the way things are going with um, the advice industry today, you know, I think people need to do more. Um, you know, if they yes, costs are rising, so you can either do one or two things: you can either stack staff or increase your revenue. Um, so it's what you, the steps you take now, and it doesn't happen overnight. And that's why so many people stop doing that is because it doesn't work in the next three, six, nine or 12 months. It's a two to five year journey. So the sooner you start, you know, and both with, you know, you need to work in two hands. You need to be building a platform that is scalable, but you also need to be building another platform that provides the clients to have that scale. It's important as building the most amazing, you know, uh, procedural steps if no new clients are walking through the door. So I think it's 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 doing both at the same time and doing that well, um, and then it sort of takes a almost a momentum of itself. It's 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 quite a bizarre experience. And I mean, you know, looking at you know how pivot's gone in the last couple of years, you know, I guarantee four years ago, if I said to you, "This is what you'd be doing in 2019," um, you know, you would have laughed at me and walked away. Yeah. But it was stuff you were doing four years ago that has brought you to this stage right now. 
And four years doesn't sound like a long time, but to consistently keep doing it and whether it's working on your procedures and constantly reinventing them or working on how to feed that funnel, those are the two key issues. Yeah, when you're a solo practitioner, you're nimble, you're fast, you can pivot quickly. It's amazing how you just do it. Yeah. But you know, as soon as you bring one, two, three, four, five people on, the issue you got to have is, you know, how do you articulate that to them? How do you push that through the system? And, um, you know, I think the biggest issue that I see with a lot of practices and, you know, we're always taking calls from people saying, you know, what do you do here? What do you do there? You know, what I'm always talking to them about is, you know, what, what's the big picture? How are you going to achieve it? But then most importantly, what you need to do to achieve it. And then they go and build this massive list and they get so overwhelmed, they go too hard. When yeah. in actual fact, they need to break it, break it down. You know, by yeah. breaking it down, what they're going to find is the process isn't actually that hard. They're just got to nibble away at it and not expect yeah. it to be done overnight. So whether mm. it's something simple as, you know, we do fact sheets for clients, you know, it's taking a bit of time to build them, but we've got fact sheets that after a introductory call, we send out to the people. Just say they can read in layman's language what a PFIC is or what is deemed disposal and those sort of things. Yeah. Um, just to show that, you know, A, we understand that they need to know about this, but B, you know, here's something that, once again, coming back to that frictionless experience. Yeah. Um, but whether I have one, 10 or 100 advisors, they're all using the same fact sheet. Yeah. So that to me, is, it's, it's that scalable thinking along those sort of lines. It's you need to be able to, provide advice consistently but in a compliant way that is scalable for sure absolutely so tell me uh if you were to go back to the start and yep. you had a clean slate what would you do differently uh a lot of things <laughs> uh i would have backed myself more and that's always an easy thing to say in hindsight in hindsight mm. but um you know I guess at the time, for the first couple of years, I was half pregnant when it came to, you know, going all in. Even though I thought I was going all in and, you know, every day I'd write a blog post and this and that and that. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, I could have done a lot more, you know, and we could have been twice as far along in, in half the amount of time uh, because of that gap in the market. But also too, um, you know, look, I think the biggest thing would be from a hiring point of view, um, there needs to be 100% buy-in in the process, you know, unequivocal. You know, that needs to be uh, the mainstay of, of that whole relationship with the employee-employer. Um, there can't be any exceptions. You what know, do you mean? You know, um, when it comes to process, processes involved, um, the delivery, you know, there was just too many exceptions, if that makes yeah. sense. And, uh, you know, when you're starting off and look, a lot of us have never been employers before. So we're like, you know, yeah. you're just going on with the flow. Yeah, this should be fine. I'm sure this should be okay. Um, and it creates so many issues because something's being delivered in a way that you don't want to deliver. And it's, you know, wasn't, not that it's non-compliant, but it's just not you. Yeah. Um, so to me, it'd be more about um, not trying to change employees is probably the best way. Yeah. You know, hire the right person at the start. Don't see something in them and say, I'm going to, you know, to take yeah. you from a piece of coal to a diamond um, because A, it's a lot of work and B, they may just be a piece of coal. Yeah. So I, say, I, say, I learned that yeah. lesson with my wife, but when you said turn, they might just be pieces of coal, I'd realised that that would be inappropriate. Yes. Love you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yang. Hi, Yang. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, look, it's something I think that, uh, you know, you can't scale without people. You can't scale without technology. They both work hand in hand. And, and yeah. you know, in the US, they call it the hybrid advisor model. And it's true. You know, I think it's something that um, uh, it's an AI form of uh, the human is the interface and has all the soft skills and can make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Mm. But everything working in the background, the processes, the procedures, the IT, um, is making that process a lot easier so that they can spend more time face to face with the clients, but also be work with more clients. You know, I mean, I've yeah. heard of some pretty crazy numbers of advisors in the US working with 600 clients and they're high touch. Wow. You know, I, I don't think 
I would like to get to that point myself. But I also think that, uh, and it depends on the clients. If, if, if you've got, you know, sort of $10 million clients, you're not going to have a thousand of those. You know, you might only no. have 50 to 80. But if you have, you know, sort of 100 to 250,000 average balances who are low touch, you can have a thousand of those and service them quite easily. Mm. Um, so I think it's a matter of, you know, the industry loves spitting out data and metrics, but I think you need to sort of take a seat back and say, well, you know, how does that work with me? You know, sure. the expat side is great because there is no foreplay when it comes to meetings. You know, if someone comes to your office, a uh, cup of teens and bickies, and you'll, you'll waste the first half an hour of um, that time yeah. discussing. And look, that's important time. But yep. when you have a video call with a client, they jump on, you get on there, you do talk about wife and kids and stuff, but you do get into it a lot quicker. Yep. And you can talk to more clients, you know, and you can get through your day quicker. So I think it's a matter of having those both of those options to be able to do it, but also having the clients buy into the process as well too. Absolutely. And so um, what would you what would what would be your top tip for somebody that was that was thinking about jump that was either someone that was about to start out and wanted to focus on efficiency and scalability or someone that wanted to refocus the a, a um, th- their business or their advice offering on, on efficiency? Top tip. They need to talk to two different people. One person in the game and one person outside of the game. And the outside of the game is the value prop. You know, do they? And, and this person has to have an experience in terms of business or, or you know, scalability sort of options, but also mm. as a client. But then someone inside the industry as well, um, who they can sort of learn from that experience. You know, and to me, it'd be a matter of sitting down and, you know, it's sort of top down, bottom up, like building a portfolio. You know, you look mm. at your asset allocation. You know, that's going to be your business model. How am I going to, you know, what service I can provide, um, analyze your market, go through and look at that. But then the bottom-up approach is how am I going to deliver that? What technology is available? What, where can I be more efficient in my time? You know, it, it's amazing. A lady I spoke to um, as part of the interview process for my first hire, um, you know, she uh, had lost a job. And I said, oh, why is that? And he said, oh, my boss sold the planning business and because of all these changes coming up. And uh, it's amazing how um, I just jumped to the conclusion that the guy was 60, 65 and didn't want to go through phase and all these things. Yeah. He was 39. <laughs> you know, and, and it was he was stuck using post-it notes, handwriting SOAs, and then handing them to be dictated. Like, it's it's amazing. It's a oh. It's a mentality point of view and i'm not surprised he just yeah. you know got burnt out Holy so God. yeah um yeah it, it's you know and then i'm still hearing there's people out there doing that it's it's amazing so for me it's something that um you know if if you are starting out you need to audit yourself both internally and externally because uh and do with people who will be, give you honest feedback because it's something that um i think sometimes we can uh convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing when in actual fact we're a year in and we should have changed that about a year ago and it can be very demoralizing it can be very um time consuming to go back and do that whole process again but then you just convince yourself no no we're fine we're fine we're fine so having those people internally and externally to sort of bounce off and say you know what do you think of this you Mm. know from a client point of view and then internally what do you think it is from a person who understands compliance and understands the regime we work in you know do you think that'll work as well too um you know you can't sit in isolation and just make decisions without sort of you know having a few mistakes and a few errors and and sort of tweaking i mean there's not a month that goes by that we don't tweak you know we've never ever just maintained the status quo for for longer than you know that longer than a month you know, there's always stuff to be worked on and it may seem so small at the time, but you combine that with the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's actually, it dovetails into quite a big uh, a big process. And, you know, I think what we do is we sort of get caught up in in the business instead of on the business and I'm the first person to, yeah, to uh, you know, to put my hand up and say, that's me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember 
was the last year before, I think it was, um, I actually shut the office down for a day, which I never do. You know, yeah. we're that busy. It just, that's that's like kryptonite to me. Um, and we sat in the boardroom and just spitballed. And then the morning was uh, operational stuff we can, you know, work on. Everyone had an equal say around the board table. And the afternoon was operational stuff that had nothing to do with financial advice. Yeah. And that was probably the afternoon session was one of the best sessions. There's the cat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's my, uh, there's my yeah. webcam wi so, Hey, Winnie. Till Tug is away. Um, you know, <laughs> and it was probably the afternoon session, which is the best session, because suddenly junior staff who don't have as much financial planning advice experience, mm. but they have good ideas. They came, they came through yeah. really quickly. And we've done things that, you know, never would have done if um, uh, we gave them that opportunity to have that voice. Absolutely, yeah. And plus, there's so much stuff that we tend to fall into that is so archaic in financial services that you sometimes having someone from outside and saying, we just go, oh, yeah, that's sort of it and, and how it's done. But having that someone from outside, you can really see, they go, well, hold on, why? Or yeah. why, why can't we do this instead? So, mate, I, I, love, I love that as a tip to, uh, to, get, to get a fresh set of eyes, but also to have someone with that, with that experience to back things up. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that, you know, I've been fortunate because I've never been in a dealer group. So I've worked as a, you know, portfolio manager slash stockbroker at Smith Barney and then got my own A for sale. So I guess I've never really been indoctrinated into the whole, you must do this for this reason, you know. Yeah. And um, look, we always, get, and we, we joke about them at work, we actually get calls from financial planners calling us up to say what we're doing is illegal. You know, it's hilarious. And, uh, yeah, we sort of question them, you know, why are they making that statement? Yeah. Uh, obviously, they've got, they got too much spare time because... Yeah, get on with you know, it. They're calling us. Um, but, yeah, they'll, they'll call us up and say, what are you doing is illegal. And, and we say, well, why is that? Well, my compliance department told me that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's their process, you know. Mm. Um, they don't go look into the process. They don't pull apart, you know, the engine, uh, which is what we do. You know, you know, when we did our AFSL application to ASIC, it had expat written all over it. You know, when we did our application to get a license here in Dubai, expat all over it. Like it's it's you know, working within the constraints and the the structure of the regime um, is how it works. Um, just doing something for the sake of doing it, um, that's just insanity if you ask me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's and it's amazing how often you see that. And if you don't have the you don't have the knowledge to challenge, then you just think that that's the way. So yeah, and then save your breath and, and the twenty minute phone call to me and go and look into it, and you'll see that it is legal. Yeah. and that's the funny. That's that's the you know, it's I don't know, it's it sort of keeps us amused anyway. <laughs> nice, mates. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. I've, I mentioned at the start that we could we could have just kept talking uh, all day, and and you know we're talking today about the produce part of the three Ps, but I could have just as easily got you in for uh, for planning and uh, and and uh, pro the profit element, which is about getting your your message out as well. A um, couple of quick ones for you though uh, before I let you go. Um, what's your biggest oops or stuff up moment in business outside of the mail service? Um, Atlas today is not what I thought it would be. Is 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 the honest way. The target market is is exactly what it is. Um, yeah. but coming from a asset management portfolio management background, um, I started Atlas because I knew experts were sitting on cash and I was going to manage the money for them. Um, where we sit now could not be any further from you know the, the, from. I guess Genesis. Um, it is, you know, we can we can do provide SOAs now with no product recommendations. It's pretty uh, pretty crazy. So we've sort of gone to that higher level now. Um, yeah. Any product recommendations are execution elements, but there's so many other moving parts to it. And you know, to us, um, you know, in the next five years, it's probably going to be even more again. You know, who knows? Um, but it's gone from a very um, you know, uh, single silo type of thing to a, you know, uh, to a multifaceted option. And I just say people go with it. You know, to me, I felt like I was coming out of my, you know, my comfort area because yeah. asset management was my speciality. Um, and then to go through this process and 
you're learning as well. And I look back now and, and it's funny, my wife still calls me a stockbroker <laughs> because, because that's what she's always known me as. But, yeah. but you know, now it's just, I couldn't be any further from the truth. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, my biggest whoops would have to be uh, going in too focused. And that's probably when I said before about we could have done twice the amount of work in half the time. If I just read the tea leaves and the feedback mm. and what people were asking for rather than telling, yeah, um, you know, yes, yeah, so Atlas will be a lot bigger now than it was originally because I was convinced this is what they wanted. This yeah. is what they wanted. Yeah, and they kept going back saying it's nice, but can you answer this question? I oh, know we don't look after that side of it. <laughs> yeah. um, whereas I should have said, "Yeah, no problems at all," and I should have yeah. solved that problem. Yeah, um, and we would have been, uh, yeah, lot, you know, instead of our first hire being in 2015, it probably would have been in 2013. Yeah, love it. Let the market let the market tell you what they want. Great the market's advice. always right. Uh, and speaking of great advice, what's the what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Uh, make it hard to spot the general by working like a soldier. I like it. I you know, like it. it's something that I would never, uh, I'm always happy to be the hardest worker. I'm always happy to get in the trenches and get dirty um, as much as my employees. You know, and I think um, when you engender that sort of spirit in the company, um, that everyone's going to knuckle in, you know, roll the sleeves up and, and let's go. Um, you do get that team sort of mentality. Um, don't dictate, I think is the best way, you know, when you're talking to employees, it's working in a conciliatory way together um, as opposed to, you know, I call it playing managing director, you know, sort of pointing and just giving people jobs. Um, you never get a scale, a culture, which is just important as scaling technology, which is most as important as scaling um, Absolutely. advice. You know, yeah. if you're going to have, like we have now, two offices, you know, yeah. I want both of those offices to be very to be very similar. Yeah. Um, but I need to bring that culture that I expect others to work by um, in those two offices. So it's something that um, don't be too afraid to be folding envelopes, you know, with with your staff members. Like just get in, just knuckle in, you know. Yeah. And it's 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 amazing how you'll see a look in their face and go, oh, okay, cool, this is great, you know. Yeah. Um, especially with newer employees. You, know, you 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 watch them; they'll really you know become ten foot tall um, mm. when they see you working beside them. So um, yeah, just knuckle in with your your team um, because that'll set the culture and that'll help you scale that culture as well too. Awesome, Emma. I was going to ask you for your top team tip, but I, that's a great one, and I'll uh, I'll take that. Mate, last <laughs> question: What's your yeah. spirit animal? Um, I don't even know what that is. You small. It's like what is an animal that you feel encapsulates your, you know, inner spirit. Okay, um, tiger. Oh, I like it. I'd say a tiger. You know, happy to uh, go out and uh, you know go forward. I guess is about the best way to describe. I was trying to think of an animal that is constantly moving forward, and um, you know, lions they sort of lie around and sleep a lot, whereas tigers you don't see that as much. So. Yeah. <laughs> there you go very majestic yeah mate mr evans thank you very much uh a pleasure as always some some epic epic tips there and uh mate i look forward to to uh hearing about the next stage in this journey and uh and seeing you crush it over there as well no thanks man and uh good luck with the uh with the newborn and um you know uh, just remember no does and and uh red bulls don't go together <laughs> Love it. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Take care. Cheers.